the numbers start to level off a little bit. Um, we already have 120 folks, which is great. Um, okay, so um, let's... Uh, Let's get things started. I'm um, really, really um, thrilled, really thrilled to be having this conversation about Zionism and the American left with two people uh, who I feel privileged to call friends and who I've learned a great deal from over the years. Uh, Rabbi Jill Jacobs, who uh, runs Trua, the rabbinical call for human rights, and uh, the writer and activist Yusef Munayar. Um, I'd encourage you both to check out their writing and their Twitter feeds. They're, they're excellent in both um, long and short form. Um, and um, this conversation is being um, co-sponsored by uh, Jewish Currents. Um, and I would encourage you to, to subscribe to Jewish Currents if you are not already doing so. And also um, by my newsletter, the Beinart Notebook at Substack. And I'd encourage you to uh, subscribe to that as well. If you're, uh, if you're interested, we do these calls every Friday, um, and it's free, um, uh, at least to get the newsletter itself. So um, before we, we, we get to the specific event that kind of has prompted a lot of conversation over the last week or 10 days, um, which was the decision of Sunrise DC to not um, participate in a voting rights march with uh, three Jewish Zionist groups, um, I wanted to ask um, uh, uh, Jill and Yusuf to talk a little bit personally about Zionism. You know. Um, uh, I was, Edward Said once wrote that to us, meaning Palestinians, Zionism has meant as much, albeit differently, as it has to Jews. And it seems to me that one of the things that in people's family experiences with Zionism can be radically different depending on where they sit. Um, and so I thought I would just start with you, Jill, and then, and then turn to Yusuf. You can talk a little bit about um, how your family history is intersected with Zionism and what it's meant to, to your family and to you. Thank you so much, Peter, for organizing this and to Jewish Currents and from you, for, to Yusuf for being on. I'm really looking forward to this conversation. Um, so I'll start by talking about my own family story. And Peter, I don't know if you want me to throw in definitions of Zionism or we'll get to that in the next. We'll, we'll do session. definitions after. Yeah, that'll Great. be the next. Okay, one. wonderful. So I grew up outside of Boston in a family that was very engaged Jewishly, that was very engaged and connected to Israel, where Hebrew language was very important. And I grew up as a child of the 80s. So that means that my, um, that really my, I grew up in the moment of Oslo. I was in college in the moment of Oslo. And I remember both that intense hope that finally there could be some hopefully lasting solution that would protect the human rights and the national aspirations of both people, as well as the crushing despair that came with the assassination of Prime Minister Rabin by a Jewish extremist. Um, the terrorism that followed, um, that included my losing friends um, in, the, in that terrorism. And so that really just hope and then ultimate despair. And then I was at the Jewish Theological Seminary where I went to rabbinical school. It's a conservative movement's um, East Coast Seminary. And I, was, I spent my, my third year of rabbinical school in Israel and that happened to be 2000, 2001. So I got there just a few days before what would become the second intifada started. And so I also went through a process that year of both being terrified for my own life and for the lives of my friends. And then also as my political knowledge was starting to mature, starting to learn more about the situation for Palestinians and starting to understand what was happening for Palestinians and learning about the closures in the West Bank, learning about the, um, the experience of occupation and, and settlement and continued to do so over the next number of years. I was back in Israel for the year in 2009. I was at the Mandel Institute in Jerusalem. And this time I came not by myself, but with my, my family, then my, my husband and my oldest daughter who was four weeks old when we landed, um, both of whom have Israeli citizenship. And so I spent a lot of that year thinking about what it meant to have this little baby who was really that big when we showed up, who had now had the two weightiest passports or some of the weightiest passports in the whole world, a US passport and an Israeli passport and what my responsibility was to that place. And I spent a lot more time that year in the West Bank 
listening to Palestinians, hearing from Palestinians, learning about the experience of occupation. And I came back after that year determined to work on this issue. I'd been previously working primarily on domestic U.S. issues. And I decided that actually I had to work on, on Israel and particularly the issue of occupation. And so I ended up by, uh, you know, what we call, what we'd say in Yiddish is Bashar, Trua, which had started in 2002, was looking for its next executive director um, in 2011. So I came on now, I've been CEO of Trua for 10 years. And Trua is the only organization in the Jewish social justice sector that has a commitment to working 50% on domestic issues in the US and Canada. Our rabbis are from the US and Canada and also issues in Israel, human rights issues in Israel and the occupied Palestinian territories. We have 2,300, 20, more than 2,300 rabbi and cantor members across the US and Canada who are committed to human rights, both where we live and also where we have these deep connections. And so the work that we do is for a future without occupation. We start with the, uh, we start with human rights. We're a human rights organization. So we start with the commitment to the human rights of Jews and Palestinians, and Israelis and Palestinians. And we want to create a world in which both people can have their human rights, um, have, can access their human rights, which include the right to self-determination, includes the right to freedom of movement, includes the right to have a passport in some country, um, et cetera, et cetera, the right to safety. And so that's the work that, we've, that we do. And I'll just give a little bit of a taste of what's been really meaningful to me. Um, one of the most meaningful pieces of our work to me is that we bring rabbinical students during their year in Israel, just like the one that I spent in Israel 20, I guess, 21 years ago. Um, most rabbinical students from liberal seminaries spend their first, second, or third year in Jerusalem. And we have a program that now engages more than 80% of those students who are in Israel for the year, where we take them to see different human rights issues, both inside of Israel proper and also in the West Bank, always with Israeli and Palestinian um, civil society and human rights leaders so that they can learn both about the situation on the ground and also learn from the people who are, who are trying to change the future and who can give them hope that there are people, really good, talented people on the ground who are trying to create a better future. Um, some of the other work that we've done, we ran a successful campaign to get JNF USA to reveal where their money is going and how much money is going to settlements. Uh, and so we were able to get them to have transparency on that and also to reduce the amount of money that's going to settlements. We've organized rabbis to oppose annexation. We take rabbis to the West Bank, at least when there's not a pandemic. Um, so our work is very much about what we believe is the future of Israel without occupation and the possibility that both people can have human rights, including the right to self-determination. That's great, thank you. Um, I just wanna say before I get to Yusuf that um, the uh, people should put questions in the Q&A. After I ask some questions, I will turn to, and I'll convey some of the questions in the Q&A. We have kept the chat open, but that's not, I'm not gonna be looking to the chat for questions. So that's really for folks to engage with one another if they want, as long as they, um, you know, if it becomes abusive or hateful, we may have to shut it off, but we'll keep it open for now. Um, Yusuf, over to you. What has, what has Zionism meant to you and your family? Yeah, thanks um, uh, to you both. Um, you know, I've I've uh, written before quite a bit. I'm sure a uh, number of people watching are familiar uh, with my own personal experiences uh, and what Zionism has meant to me and my family, both uh, as a uh, Palestinian citizen of Israel whose uh, grandparents survived uh, the Nakba and the mass depopulation of the vast majority of Palestine's native inhabitants uh, from 1947 to 1949, uh, as someone who uh, was born a second-class citizen uh, and uh, continues to be considered a demographic threat uh, by uh, the state of Israel, uh, just by virtue of existing as a non-Jewish citizen. Um, but I, I don't want to. I don't want to spend a whole lot of time on our own, my own family's personal experiences, in part because I have uh, written about this, people have heard about it. But I want to just focus a little bit more broadly on what Zionism has meant to Palestinians, because all Palestinians who have um, uh, encountered it and all of us have encountered it, uh, have had many common threads running through uh, their personal stories. Uh, 
Zionism meant the dismemberment of our national body. It meant the dispersal of our family and friends. It meant the destruction of our towns uh, and our villages, uh, our graveyards and our holy sites, uh, hundreds if not thousands of them, uh, and the denial of our self-determination uh, long before the beginning of the occupation of the West Bank and the Gaza Strip in Jerusalem in 1967. Uh, all of these devastating impacts uh, of this political ideology have been plaguing Palestinians uh, for for many years prior to uh, the beginning of the sixty seven uh, occupation. Um, this is this is what Zionism has meant to us. And short, I think it's appropriate that you uh, began this conversation quoting Edward Said uh, because I think the the differences about the experiences are pretty clear um, for Palestinians. Uh, Zionism has been an absolutely devastating force uh, that has uh, inflicted massive destruction on us in every possible way uh, and continues to do so through this day. Um, so I think, you know, I, I would sum it up as that. Thanks. Um, I, I want to, part of the issue, I think, with, with talking about Zionism um, is that, um, um, the term is defined differently by different people. Um, uh, and um, so I wanna, before we go into the specific question of what happened with Sunrise and um, the relationship between Zionism and the left, I wanna ask each of you a little bit and I'll, I'll start uh, going back to Jill. Jill, if someone said to you, what is Zionism? How do you define Zionism or, or the range of different Zionisms? How would you answer that question? Thank you, first of all, I wanna thank you so for sharing a bit of your family story here and, and in your writing. And I want to say, first of all, that what happened to your family and to other Palestinians in 1948 and before is terrible. And I think it's important for Jews and for Israelis to acknowledge that. And I think in order to move forward, that Jews and Israelis need to acknowledge the Nakba and that God willing will be part of a truth and reconciliation process or whatever we're going to call it, because I do think that we have to, we have to acknowledge that in order to, to move forward. Um, and figure out just as in this country, we have to figure out what uh, we haven't really come to terms with, for example, the genocide of Native Americans or with slavery. And we we're starting hopefully to come to terms with that. And we need to figure out what kind of reparations we can do knowing that we can't go back and change the past. I think that process also has to happen. So I just wanted to start by saying that. In terms of de defining Zionism, there are many, many uh, definitions as Peter said for Zionism. Um, but I'll say that in short, Zionism started in the late 19th and early 20th century um, as part of the minority rights movement. So the, in a moment when many other national minorities were seeking collective rights, particularly in Europe, Zionism was a movement of Jews also seeking collective rights um, until the, there had been a very long process of Jews achieving emancipation, sometimes you know, two steps forward, one step back, but achieving for the most part individual rights, but this was an ask for, for national rights. And there were, um, and again, in the context when a lot of national minorities were seeking, were seeking national rights. Um, something that I think that people on the both far, I don't necessarily want to characterize, but often the, the far, people who define themselves as Zionists and people who define themselves as anti-Zionist both sometimes get wrong is that Zionism is neither a continuation nor a rupture with Judaism. So something that is true is that Judaism always had a connection to Eretz Yisrael, to the land of Israel from the very beginning. Um, you know, certainly we pray for a return to, to Eretz Yisrael three times a day and it's baked into all of our holidays and our fast days and I could go on and on. Um, what was different about, so for the people, there are some people who will say, well, Judaism has no connection to the land of Israel and the, the temple never existed and et cetera, et cetera. That's really a denial of Jewish history. At the same time, what Zionism was a rupture in that for thousands of years, we prayed for a return to Israel, but the idea was that there would have to be divine intervention to make that happen. And Zionism was saying, actually, we can use political means, whether that's appealing to the Sultan during the Ottoman Empire, appealing to the British colonial powers to, um, to go back to, to the land of Israel. So that's the rupture to say that there can be human intervention. 
and, and a use of political power. Um, you know, Zionism, before the beginning, in the late 19th, early 20th century, there were lots of debates about, does that mean going back and living as subjects of the Sultan or later the British colonial powers? Does it mean a binational state? Does it mean a single Jewish state? Does it mean, right, there were lots and lots of debates about what, what a return to that land for the people um, who are coming back or coming from Europe and other places um, later, Northern Africa and the Arab world, what that actually meant. Um, just also acknowledging that there was always an old Jewish community, primarily in places like Jerusalem and Hebron and Sfat, some of the older cities. Um, so there were a lot of opinions about what would be, but you know, where I stand is that Zionism was this movement to establish a Jewish presence, a state, a, just a Jewish state, a binational state, no state, et cetera, et cetera, all of those debates that happened in the ancestral land of Israel. And in 1948, Israel became a country and became a member of the UN. So I actually think that the term Zionism has outlived its usefulness. The term should have been retired in 1948, just like we don't talk about the other movements that have created other newer countries, like the movements to create South Sudan or East Timor or any of the countries that have been created in our own lifetimes. And um, that we shouldn't talk about Zionism anymore, that what we should actually talk about is what the situation is on the ground. And the situation on the ground is there is a country called Israel, it exists, it's a member of the UN. Again, some people might not like that, but it, it is the reality on the ground. It's a country that has close to 9 million citizens, about 80% of whom are Jewish, about 20% of whom are Palestinian citizens of Israel, and also is an occupying power over another some 5 million Palestinians living in Gaza, in, in the Gaza Strip, in East Jerusalem, and in the West Bank, who don't have citizenship for the most part in any country. Um, and the thing that is most urgent is to end the occupation. So I understand that uh, certainly there's, there's debates about, um, you know, cer certainly Palestinian citizens of Israel don't have the same, or uh, don't have the same equal legal rights as Jewish citizens of Israel, and that is something that both Palestinian citizens and Jewish citizens are, are fighting and should continue to fight for that democracy and that equality. And what is most urgent right now is to end the occupation. That's a moral and political imperative. And I do think that that is primarily, the responsibility is primarily on the Israeli government, which is the occupying power. Um, and so I don't see any contradiction between being supportive of the long-term safety and security of the state of Israel and also fighting for an end to occupation as many civil society and human rights groups both in Israel and in Palestine are doing. Um, you know, my, I support two states, one side by you know, is the Israel side by side with the state of Palestine, either with hard borders, with a confederation, we can argue all of that out, but that the moral and political imperative is to end the occupation. And also, as I said, to ensure the equal rights of Palestinian citizens of Israel. So I look to groups like Omdi and Biachad, Standing Together and Sikui that are bringing together Israel, uh, Jewish and Palestinian citizens of Israel to do that work together. Um, so I'll just end there. I'm sure we'll talk more about all of that. Um, so Yusuf, to you, do you think it is still important to talk about Zionism? Um, and, uh, and, and how would you define Zionism? Yeah, I, I, you know, you probably won't be surprised to know I have a, a different take uh, on this. Uh, I still think it's absolutely relevant. Um, Zionism is a political ideology and a political movement uh, that importantly sought not only to establish a Jewish homeland, but to do so in a particular historical context and at a particular historical moment and under a particular historical circumstances. And I think any um, uh, objective, honest evaluation of the morality of uh, such an ideology or movement has to take into consideration uh, that context. It's not uh, an idea that we could think about in a vacuum, but an idea that had very real consequences for very real people. Uh, and as uh, I began to discuss earlier, uh, meant very different things for Palestinians than it did uh, for uh, for Jews. Um, and I, I think Zionism is an ideology that continues to animate and direct policies that are being carried out to this day. 
uh, the state of Israel is both a manifestation of Zionist ideology and a vehicle that continues uh, to perpetuate Zionist ideology. Uh, we are seeing today, this week, uh, Palestinians uh, removed uh, from their land, settlements expanding inside of Palestine, uh, using some of the very same exclusionary policies and practices uh, that began in the 1910s and 20s, uh, as uh, Zionist settlement began uh, to grow in Palestine during that period. Um, so it, it, it absolutely continues to be relevant. Uh, there is, uh, in, in my view, uh, a unified historic trajectory of this ideology impacting Palestinians in very similar ways across the past century. Uh, I do not see 1967 as a fundamental transformation point, but rather the continuation of a process that Zionist ideology uh, is carrying out in Palestine. Uh, and so, you know, it, it remains absolutely relevant to this day. And I think any conversation uh, around it as an ideology has to take into consideration what it's meant for Palestinians throughout the entirety of this time and, to, and continues to mean uh, today. Thanks. Uh, Yusuf, I want to stick with you um, because the, the focus of this conversation really is about the relations between Zionism and the American left. There are many, many, many questions um, that um, uh, uh, other kinds of questions that we can be dealing with. But I, I now that we've kind of put out on the table a little bit some of the different ways that, that folks understand Zionism, the, the incident in, in, in question um, was a decision by Sunrise DC, so that's the Washington DC branch of the larger Sunrise uh, environmental movement, not to participate in a voting rights march because three groups um, uh, were participating, the National Council of Jewish Women, the Religious Action Center of Reform Judaism, um, and um, uh, the National the Jewish Council of Public Affairs. These are all organizations that do define themselves as Zionist and do, do some work on uh, Israel, but uh, I think probably do the bulk of their work, or at least a lot of their work on kind of domestic issues like voting rights, that you know that's why they've been invited to this march. And so Sunrise DC said, we will not partner. We will not participate in this in this rally uh, if they're if they're participating. I, I think that although Sunrise DC is maybe only one small organization, I do think this is part of perhaps a larger trend um, uh, that one is seeing um, on the American left. And so, Yusuf, I wanted to ask you what you thought about this decision and um, how you think more generally about whether you think uh, self-identified Zionist organizations should be welcomed into coalitions for things like voting rights or environmental justice or or whatever? I think what fundamentally what we're talking about is a clash of values. And this is what this comes down to. And I think there's an interesting question about why are we seeing more of this now? Why is there why is there greater contention around this now in progressive spaces with Zionists or Zionist organizations or supporters of um, of this ideology? Um, and I think the reason comes down to the fundamental difference in the way that uh, folks like Jill and I see this uh, ideology. The more you see Palestinians and the more you see what Zionism has done to Palestinians, the more you realize the direct value clash between the values that, that you know, groups on the left hold dear and the values that Zionism represents. Uh, if we think about Zionism as a vacuum and something that is a minority rights movement for Jews and ignore or sidestep or de-emphasize what it has meant for Palestinians, uh, it, it can in some ways coexist with the values on the left. Um, but the more you see Palestinians, and I think this is one of the things that's fundamentally changed over time, and it's good, and it needs to continue to happen, and it will lead to further conflict between Zionists and, and groups on the left, is that over time people have increasingly come to see Palestinians in the picture, understand what Zionism has meant to them, and realize that there's a fundamental conflict between those values and the rest of the values that they advocate for. I mean, uh, you know, we're, we're, I think we were talking about a, a voting rights march. What does it mean to march for voting rights while supporting a state that denies the right to vote to millions of people who are living under military occupation? I mean, is, is, does anyone else see the, the fundamental conflict here? Um, so I think this is something that is going to continue to happen because more and more people are starting to understand what Zionism has meant to Palestinians specifically and not just meant uh, for uh, the Jewish community or some parts uh, of the Jewish community. Uh, 
Jill, I, I imagine you, you see it differently. So uh, what was your reaction to, to Sunrise DC's decision? Sure, well, let me first start by talking about coalitions because coalitions are really complicated. And often in coalition, you're with people who you don't agree with on issues other than the one that you're working with. So Taraz worked, for example, with the Catholic Church on issues of solitary confinement. And I can tell you that there's a lot of things we don't agree with the Catholic Church about, particularly around LGBTQ rights and reproductive rights. And um, we've partnered with evangelicals and other religious groups around torture, which is a campaign we started working on in 2003 against state-sponsored torture. So, um, and this is something the right knows really well, like how is it that Wall Street Republicans and evangelicals could come together to elect Donald Trump, right? The right knows that sometimes you win what you want through coalitions with people who you don't agree with on other issues. So that is the nature of coalitions. Um, I don't believe in purity tests on the left. I don't believe that everybody in a coalition needs to agree on everything. And I also would note that um, it is the Jewish organizations that's be, that are being asked about their position on Zionism. I don't think that we would have a situation where there's a Hindu American association that's being asked about Modi or Chinese um, organizations that are being asked about their position on the Uyghurs or anything else. So in coalitions, so first of all, in coalitions, we shouldn't have purity tests, we'll never get anything done. And also this is a situation where there is a focus on, on the Jewish organizations. Um, you know, as I mean, Yusuf and I can disagree about what Zionism means. And, um, but I'll say again, that Zionism does mean different things to different people. So for some, re so for some people, their Zionism compels them to support occupation. For other people, it just means that Israel exists, that they support the, the future of the state of Israel existing. Um, the particular organizations that we're talking about are all have two state positions, um, which you know, supports there being a state of Israel next to a state of Palestine someday, which necessitates the end of occupation. As I said, it, it also, I do think there needs to be a coming to terms with Nakba and with the whole history before 1967 also. Um, so I think that there's sometimes when we, there's a, a developing sense of a, a, there's a dichotomy, right? That either you have to be pro-Israel or pro-Palestine, pro-Israeli, pro-Jewish, pro-Palestinian. And that is a really unhealthy dichotomy. And it's also a failure of imagination to imagine that there could be a possibility that in which the human rights of both peoples are protected, in which we can acknowledge the national, um, aspirations of both people who are living in that land, recognize that nobody's going anywhere and everybody has the right to safety and security there. We can argue about whether that's in two states, one state, a confederation, by national state, like we can have all sorts of arguments, reasonable people can disagree about that. But to say, actually, it's not about one or the other, but there is a possibility that would recognize the human rights, including the right to citizenship of the country and self-determination, et cetera, of, of everybody there. Um, the final thing that I would say is that the vast majority, we know from polling that the vast majority of American Jews consider themselves broadly pro-Israel, it's over 90%, and also the majority of American Jews, depending what survey you look at, but always generally over 50%, consider themselves anti-occupation, anti-settlement, and, and don't see that as a, as a contradiction. Um, and I want to speak to the, the 90 some percent of Jews who consider themselves generally pro-Israel and the majority of Jewish organizations um, have that connection to Israel for many reasons, but one of them is because it's the place where more than half of the, or, or roughly half of the, the world's Jewish population lives. And I just wanna take that on a, a people level. I work at a human rights organization say that it's not reasonable to ask Jewish organizations to give up a connection to the country where half of the world's Jewish population lives. Um, many of those organizations are really invested in working on the rights of uh, both Jews and Palestinians. Many of them are working, uh, do work against settlement and, and occupation. It is fair to push organizations on, well, what is your position on settlements? What's your position on, on occupation? What are you doing for democracy inside of Israel? Many of these organizations are actually working on that, um, but it is not reasonable to expect that the majority of Jewish organizations are just going to say we're walking away. We have we have no relationship to this place. Sorry to the the Jews who live there. That's great. I also just want to acknowledge I, I'm seeing a lot of conversation in the chat and, and really great questions. And I it's it's I, one of the things I, it's really wonderful to see 
I can see we have a very wide range of people of different perspectives here, and um, that that makes me very happy. Um, and I and I feel like the interaction that I'm seeing is is very respectful and thoughtful. And um, anyway, it's a testament to, to to Jill and Yusuf that they can that they can they can bring such a group of people together. Um, uh, I feel like that's something that doesn't happen enough. Um, Yusuf, so I want to just ask you to kind of respond a little bit to two things that I heard uh, Jill saying, and that I see we have some questions in the chat about as well. The first is isn't by the nature of, of political coalitions that you have to bring in groups that you necessarily disagree with. And, and um, there are big, big problems in the United States, you know, our democracy, the survival of American democracy being one of them. And so is it really, is it, is it really wise strategically to make Zionism a litmus test for such coalitions? And, and what other litmus tests might one therefore have to start making? Um, so that would be the, the one. The second would be that, that, that this can end up targeting Jews Specifically, as you know, I'm sure you know, some people have noticed the, noted the fact that that Sunrise DC didn't object to um, uh, the American Federation of Teachers, even uh, even though they are also a group that has made pro-Israel statements and I think has an official position of supporting a Jewish state. So I, I'd like you to I want to uh, I want to I'm going to push Jill a little bit on some of the counter arguments, but I want to push you a little bit to answer those two arguments that I've that I've heard uh, her, her raise. Well, I think anyone who's ever been involved with coalition building knows that people draw lines about who they're going to involve themselves with in coalitions all the time. This is this is not new. It's just a question of at what point people start saying that they need to draw a line around support for Zionism and support for Israel, uh, a state which, as you know, recently heard from Human Rights Watch and others, including Israeli the human rights organization say is practicing apartheid against Palestinians. Uh, it's it's 2021, folks. When when are people going to start taking positions around these issues? Now, I, I, I think that that needs to be done in careful and specific ways. And obviously, the point raised about, um, you know, how how it's done is important. Um, and uh, I think, you know, uh, Sunrise acknowledged that uh, the way that that went down is something that they regret, while I think admirably um, not backing down on the principled position of opposing the ideology. And I think this is going to continue to be a issue of tension because of this fundamental values clash. And I don't think it's impossible to work on other issues while drawing lines. Um, again, people people do that all the time in coalition building. So, Jill, let me. Um pick up on that a little bit in, in a question to you. I think that um, uh, the organizations that that were part of the, that were um, that were going to be part of this march um, are on on their sir on this, you know support a two-state solution in theory. But I think one of the things that you and my may and I may agree on is that there are a lot of American Jewish organizations that that support us two-state solution in theory, but in reality are not doing anything to to to, to address Palestinian rights. And in fact, are really spending a lot of their energy making it very difficult for, to put any pressure on the Israeli government to change their behavior at all. So couldn't there be an argument that unless these organizations um, feel some pressure, some discomfort from their progressive allies in some form, unless they're challenged and they feel some consequences, that they may just continue down this path of least resistance, which is uh, a path, you know, a position of, of real complicity with whether you ultimately support two states as, as you do or, or, or one equal state as I do, that we, that, that we would still agree is a position of complicity with the denial of fundamental human rights. Sure, I don't want to talk in depth about the particular organizations, sure. um, but, you know, I, I will say that two of the organizations, the Reform Movement or the RAC, um, which is part of the Reform Movement, and uh, National Council of Jewish Women are actually organizations that work, um, I mean, they do have two state positions, but they also, the, the reform movements, IRAC, uh, the Center in Israel does a lot of anti-racism work. They're pretty deeply involved in democracy inside of Israel for Palestinian citizens of Israel and NCJW does funding for women, in, again, inside of Israel, as far as I know, I could be wrong about that, but for both Palestinian citizens and, and Jewish citizens. So I don't know that there was a real look at, um, at what those organizations are doing. But beyond that, I'll say that you know, as an organization that uh, you know, TRA, the organization that I, that, where, that I run is very clearly, as I said before, 
We are um, pro two state, but it's not just lip service. We're actively fighting occupation. That's what we're doing. And we're actively fighting settlement expansion and the entrenchment of occupation. And I do think that it's reasonable to ask other Jewish organizations that have two state positions to take that, to, to also do that work, to really press and say, okay, you have a two state position, but what are you doing? So for example, like we're supporting as is J Street and Americans for Peace Now and others, the two state bill that is um, currently in Congress that was um, introduced by uh, Congress member Andy Levin, right? And which has very specific implications, really positive implications for, um, for Palestinians and I think also for Israelis. And to, it's reasonable for progressive allies to say to Jewish organizations, you have a two state position, are you supporting this bill? What are you doing to end occupation? And those are conversations that um, can happen among allies. I think one thing that was very problematic about the Sunrise DC statement is that it was a statement that came out, it seems like without any conversation among partners. I'll tell you that as an organization that's involved in lots of coalitions with lots of people who we agree with on certain things and not on other things, including ones who really press us about Israel, we have those conversations all of the time. And you can have those conversations in partnership and often respond to partners who are pushing you in one direction or another. I think those are really important. They shouldn't be, it shouldn't be hands off. We can't talk about Israel because we're working on um, women's rights or voting rights in the United States or whatever it is, but we should be able to, to have those real conversations and push each other. Isa, I wanted to ask you a little bit to talk about, I mean, um, am I right in understanding that your view would be that any organization that supports um, a Jewish state um, is therefore incompatible with progressive values. And isn't there a, a little bit of a, uh, isn't there a little bit of an irony there in that essentially, if you're looking at the, the, the palace, you know, the, the, P, the Mahmoud Abbas and the, you know, who runs the PLO um, has himself essentially taken this position. Right of supporting of supporting two states and maybe he doesn't. And, um, um, so isn't if if we make the litmus test for any any American organization that supports a Jewish state in any form and is therefore classified as Zionist, aren't we essentially also saying that we would by that definition have to basically cut out in, cut out any coalitions with you know with with Palestine, certain Palestinian leaders themselves? I mean, there is still according to polling a significant amount of support for two states among Palestinians on the ground in the West Bank and Gaza. So I'm wondering how you think through that. Well, uh, Peter, you probably know this, but I uh, don't uh, let Mahmoud Abbas be my <laughs> litmus test on what progressive values are. And I would suggest that, um, you know, you, you probably shouldn't either. Um, that, uh, that being said, look, uh, organizations, like I said, all the time, think about where and how they draw their lines based on the issues that they feel are important. And these are things that can change over time. Um, people are increasingly starting to see Palestinians. This issue is going to become increasingly contentious because people are tired of it. Um, and yes, more and more groups are going to be pushed to change their positions on this issue. And that's a good thing. And frankly, I don't think hiding behind support for a two-state solution cuts it. I don't think it's ever cut it, and I think it's going to, you know, be less and less likely uh, to cut it moving forward. Whatever one says their position is on this solution or that, if if you are in support of a state, and some of these organizations, um, you know, are are working to support billions of dollars in military funding for the the state of israel which is the primary vehicle enabling the continuation of the the, the very occupation they say they want to see come to an end um that that just that just can't cut it uh and i think that you're going to see more and more as i said organizations be pressed on this issue again exactly how that's done is uh open to conversation and uh debate but no i don't think that support for a state that's practicing apartheid uh, is compatible with progressive values. Um, so I want to stick with you on 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 um, on this. One of the um, interesting things about the moment we're in, right, is that while this there's this emerging debate in certain quarters on the left about whether Zionist groups should be should be allowed 
to participate. There's also a kind of a whole other debate, right, uh, in more powerful places about whether anti-Zionists should be allowed to participate, right? I mean, in the sense that, you know, many states and, and even parts of the federal government essentially adopt the definition of anti-Semitism, which, which defines anti-Zionism as, as, as anti-Semitism and bigotry. Um, and we've seen issues about questions about whether Linda Saussure should be allowed to be at the Women's March because she's an anti-Zionist. Do you think that one of the things that I wonder about is if you want to push against the exclusion of anti-Zionists, um, which means in practice the exclusion of Palestinians uh, in, in, in many cases, um, is that going to be a successful strategy while you're simultaneously pushing for the exclusion of Zionists? Or wouldn't it be actually a more effective strategy to basically say we, should, that we shouldn't have litmus tests for either of these, of these positions? Peter, I don't think these two things are comparable at all. Uh, in one case, when we're talking about the um, massive global organized effort to silence Palestinian dissent against Israeli human rights violations, uh, which is uh, something we are seeing here in the United States, uh, in Europe and elsewhere around the world with the support of the Israeli government, we are talking not about uh, you know, excluding people from certain spaces, but in many cases, criminalization uh, and constitutional violations of, pe of people's rights. Uh, we're not talking about not participating with people uh, in a rally, right? We're talking about something fundamentally different. We're talking about state coercion. Uh, these, I think, are things that are not uh, comparable at all. And unfortunately, I think where some of these conversations intersect is in this effort to uh, as, as you point out, define anti-Zionism as anti-Semitism, uh, which uh, I believe is rooted in an effort to silence uh, Palestinian dissent uh, across the board. Uh, we see this with the proliferation of what's called the IHRA definition of anti-Semitism, uh, which the uh, Israeli government would like to see used uh, as a tool to define various forms of dissent uh, as anti-Semitic. Uh, and it should come as no surprise, I think, that this uh, is something we are seeing proliferating as uh, anti-BDS legislation uh, is, uh, you know, uh, being ruled unconstitutional um, in uh, court decision after court decision. Uh, this pathway of trying to uh, make dissent itself anti-Semitic is an effort to circumvent the First Amendment uh, entirely. And unfortunately, uh, it's not uh, groups like Sunrise DC, which are, you know, a small group of, of progressive advocates uh, in, uh, in Washington DC who are making decisions around this stuff. Uh, it's governments, uh, it's members of Congress, uh, it's extremely powerful forces, which I don't think we can uh, in any way put on, on, uh, into comparison with uh, what, um, uh, you know, what, what we're talking about here with the decision to not work with uh, organizations that support uh, the Israeli government or the Israeli state. Um, Jill, I'm seeing a number of questions in the chat which, which go to this question about the, the role of the two-state solution at this point. And I, I guess I wanna ask you, I think one of the, um, the, the things that I hear in what you is saying is, is that um, the, the, the two-state solution uh, may have become for a lot of people a, a kind of a way of, um, of essentially accepting the status quo or that it's, it's, it's become a, it's, it's, um, it's, it's no longer essentially a kind of a, a sufficient position to take um, a ba because, because it's in reality on the ground, it seems more and more fanciful and that ultimately it, it may also not deal with more fundamental issues of equity. Um, um, so I wonder how, you think at this point, um, you still think about the two-state solution. And, and if you can imagine uh, a moment in which you might say um, uh, that actually we need to move away from this paradigm and that that, that might actually recast this whole question about the relationship between Zionism and the, and the left. Sure, I wanted to say a word about some of what you said about um, yeah. the legal attacks on BDS and anti-Zionism, because I absolutely agree with that. I, um, you know, something that Shra has done is we've filed a number of um, amicus briefs in a number of states about 
the standing up for free speech against the various laws about BDS, um, including in Arkansas, a case that's currently going back and forth in the courts where we had one of our members who's the rabbi of the largest synagogue in the state speaking very publicly, in addition to the brief that we filed, speaking very publicly about why he supports free speech, um, even though he doesn't participate in, in BDS and, and we also are not boycotting Israel as an organization, but we do believe in free speech. And I think that um, there is an imperative, no matter what you what you think about BDS, to stop that attack on free speech. Um, and I'll also say that during the immigration protests, we got lots of calls from Jews and, and synagogues and Jewish organizations saying, hey, this immigration protest is being organized by CARE. Should we go? And we might see signs. You know, there might, is this going to turn into anti-Israel? Is it can we partner with these people? And our answer is always yes, we are fighting about immigration in the United States and you stand with people who you might not agree with in other places and you need to talk to them. You know, you can have conversations, but you, you go and you stand up for immigrants. So I think that is really important. I really don't believe in those kinds of litmus tests. Um, so in terms of two states, look, if the, if the, if the people, if, the, if someday, God willing, the, um, there is an actual peace negotiation and the people at the table decide that what they're going to, what they want is one state by national state, whatever it is, and they can agree on that. Okay, fine. Um, for me, the most important thing is that the human rights of both peoples are, are preserved and respected. I still do believe that two states is the most likely and possible way to realize that, um, that I don't see that, it, I mean, look, we're, Israel has not, despite the position, if there isn't even an official two-state position anymore, Israel has not been willing to give up territory um, to move toward an actual two-state solution. So I think the idea that Israel is suddenly gonna move toward a one-state solution is not really reasonable. Um, when we think about what happened in 1948, we know that of course, um, hundreds of thousands of Palestinians were, um, pushed out of their homes, were evicted from their homes in the Nakba. And we also know that about 1% of the Jewish population at the time was killed. And I, I would not doubt that Israel would be willing to, to do that, to lose people again in order to preserve the state of Israel. So I don't think that one state is possible now, maybe in 50 years, maybe in 100 years, maybe after we have two states that have managed to live side by side for a long time, they'll come together and decide that there's another possibility. But I do still believe that this is the most likely possibility. I think that all of the arguments about how it's not possible, there's too many facts on the ground, that's just a failure of political imagination to think that you can't, um, that the number of people who would actually have to move can't be moved. There's lots of data and statistics about how it's not actually impossible. And um, so, and I, you know, I, th I think that we have to have hope. We have to do our work out of hope. We have to believe that there's a, a solution. Right now, the most likely solution on the table is two states, which would allow both people to have their, uh, their national aspirations met, to have a state. I would hope that both of those states are democratic places where the 20% of Israelis who are Palestinian citizens can continue to live in their homes, can have equal rights within Israel. I would hope that Jews can be citizens of Palestine, not as Israeli citizens, with their Israeli citizenship and um, rights that they bring with them like the settlers do, but as Palestinian citizens. So I would hope that all of that becomes possible, but I still see that two states is the most likely solution. And as you mentioned, it's still the solution that is favored by the PA, by the PLO, um, you know, maybe officially or less by Israel and by Jewish organizations. And I also believe that, yes, yeah, saying you're pro two states, look, APAC says that they support two states, but the actions they take belie that. So I think that for organizations that say that they support two states, there also needs to be a push to say, okay, well, what are you doing to move that forward? The most important thing is to fight against occupation, to fight against expansion of settlements and all of the moves that Israel takes to take land from Palestinians, to move Palestinians from their homes, um, house demolitions, et cetera, et cetera. And so if you really believe in two states, yes, you have to actively be fighting against occupation. It's not enough just to say that you have a two state position. Um, we have about 10 minutes left. Um, I'm, we're gonna put back a, a, a link to, um, to Jewish Currents and also to my newsletter in the, in the chat. So I'd encourage people to, 
to check both of those out. Um, Yusuf, I, I want to ask a little bit, we have a question in the chat, which kind of puts a bit of a fine point on this, but, um, you know, is what about an, partnering with an organization like Trua or, or J Street? I mean, these are organizations that also support a Jewish state, but I think uh, are doing, uh, are actively trying to end the occupation, perhaps in ways that some of those other Jewish organizations were not, some of those other Zionist Jewish organizations. Would they also be, in your view, organizations that should not be partnered with because they support a Jewish state? Yeah, I want to just respond to um, a, a bit of what uh, Jill was saying and in a way sort of touch uh, on this question uh, as well. Um, you know, we, <laughs> the, the way I increasingly hear this idea of support for a two-state solution, uh, especially from folks, uh, you know, who call themselves liberal or from Democrat officials, for example, uh, is very much akin to the way that Republicans reply with thoughts and prayers anytime we we hear about the gun debate. Uh, it's a way to um, suggest uh, that you care about a horrific situation uh, without taking any of the necessary steps within your power to actually address your own complicity in the horrors that are taking place. Um, and I think for, for, for too long, it's been used to sort of deflect uh, addressing complicity. And, you know, I, I would, to an extent, agree with Jill that at the end of the day, while I take a very different perspective on, you know, the, the uh, idea of one state versus two, um, I, I would agree that it is the people who live in the land who have to live under an agreed upon set of rules and there is no peace process now and whatever. But in the interim, our complicity in the human rights abuses of the Israeli state continues. Where, wherever you stand on one state or two, and again, my views are very clear on this, um, we cannot allow organizations or, or uh, officials to say, I support a two-state solution as a way out of addressing their complicity in ongoing human rights violations that exist today. And I think as well that organizations need to be pushed beyond this issue of the 67 occupation because that is not the uh, totality of the issue uh, that uh, Israel's violations against Palestinians predate 1967. Uh, the ongoing legacy of that continues. Uh, Palestinians continue to be denied uh, the right to return to their homes and their properties, um, and and so on. So I don't I don't think that that's sufficient. Exactly how those conversations play out and what positions different organizations take, um, it's 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 up to them to uh, decide. But I think all of these groups should be pushed to address the fundamental problem Zionism has presented to Palestinians uh, and address how it clashes with the you know the supposed uh, other progressive values that they hold. Um, Jill, I wanted to ask you, we're just about running out of time, but one of the things that, Amer that, that established American Jewish organizations often suggest is that there's a lot of anti-Semitism on the American left. Um, um, and you operate on the American left. You are, you know, your progressive organization working for progressive issues. I'm, I'm curious, do you think that's true? Well, there's a lot of anti-Semitism everywhere. I mean, there's a lot of racism, there's a lot of sexism, there's a lot of everything, um, but there's certainly a lot of anti-Semitism everywhere. Now, my biggest fear, I mean, we just had the three year anniversary of the murders in Pittsburgh. And um, my biggest fear is the uh, white nationalists who are, who are armed and dangerous and who clearly see anti-Semitism as part of their uh, just, as, part of their ideology. So that's my greatest fear. Um, and a lot of the other violent attacks on Jews has been what I would say sort of outside of politics, right? It's not necessarily politically motivated. It's not justifiable. It's not okay. There's no justification for it, but it's not something that is specifically a left-right issue. It has to do with, well, I'm not going to try to explain or justify, but um, not necessarily a left-right issue. And um, so there is a lot of anti-Semitism. I'll say that you know, in our work, the most often, often the place that I see it is actually not about Israel at all. It's people who just really don't have experience with Jews saying things about Jews with money, 
right? Like, oh, Jews are really good with money. Oh, I didn't know that was a stereotype. I thought it was a compliment, right? The, the same kinds of oop statements that people, I mean, people make racist statements and sexist statements and Islamophobic statements all the time. And, and in partnership, we have to educate and we have to, um, and, and we have to respond to that. Um, there's certainly, so I don't believe that being anti-Zionist is being an anti-Semite. I certainly would never expect a Palestinian to be to be Zionist or to be probably anything but anti-Zionist. Um, so I don't think that that is equated with, with anti-Semitism. Um, I, you know, I'm a supporter, I'm a signer of the Jerusalem Declaration, which is something that is um, set up to be another option other than IHRA that specifically distinguishes between criticism of Israel and anti and anti-Semitism. So I'll say all that, and I will say that there is often anti-Semitism in some of the Israel discourse in the, in the, um, on the, the far left. Uh, we have to be very careful about distinguishing it. So for example, one of the distinctions I made before is saying, for example, that Jews have no historic relation to the land of Israel is anti-Semitic, that's denying Jewish history. Arguing about whether Israel should have been created, how it should have been created, what should happen now, that's not anti-Semitic, that's a political argument. Um, I've seen a lot more, it's something I learned about in history class when I was a kid, but now I'm seeing it come back, the um, conspiracy about the, the, the anti-Semitic conspiracy theory about the Khazars, that modern uh, Ashkenazi Jews are all descended from these Khazar converts, right? It's not true and it's an anti-Semitic conspiracy theory, this language of like, well, you're not real Jews anyway. So it does, so it for sure does come up. On the left, I think we have to counter it. And I think for those of us who place ourselves on the left, no matter where you are in the left, no matter what your views on Israel-Palestine are, uh, we don't need to deny the reality of that the, today's Jews are real Jews. We don't need to deny the reality of Jews' historic connection to the land of Israel in order to argue for whatever political position we're arguing for. So we do need to, to make those distinctions. So if I want to give you the last word, I want to ask you to talk a little bit about what your experience has been um, in progressive movements on the American left with the question of anti-Semitism. And I also want to ask you about what it's like dealing with the burden that Palestinians face to prove themselves not anti-Semites, that, that, uh, um, uh, given that, that that charge is so frequently used uh, against, against people who, against Palestinians and others who support Palestinian rights. So I'm just, I just wanted to ask you what, what that's been like in your work. Well, look, um, where do I even begin with this? Um, you know, I, I look at the struggle for freedom for Palestinians uh, to be uh, one about human values uh, and human rights. Um, and uh, I don't see any way that one can uh, support that uh, and support bigotry or racism against any other group. Uh, these things are fundamentally incompatible. Um, so for me, it has not been uh, difficult to be able to hold those views and oppose anti-Semitism. Um, at the same time, it's very clear that charges of anti-Semitism are weaponized, uh, increasingly so, uh, to silence Palestinian voices. Uh, this entire discourse around whether or not anti-Zionism is anti-Semitism is specifically uh, directed at Palestinian voices. Uh, and specifically directed at silencing uh, conversation around refugee rights, uh, silencing conversation about equality for Palestinian citizens, uh, because uh, anti-Semitism in these definitions is defined as questioning, you know, the existence of a Jewish state or what have you, uh, which means that we can't call for equality for Palestinians without being called anti-Semites, or we can't call for the right of Palestinian refugees to return without being called anti-Semites. The entire purpose of these definitions is not just to chill debate, but to silence Palestinian voices in particular within these debates. Um, and so, you know, there, there is no reason, uh, there's no difficulty in actually standing up against anti-Semitism because uh, it is uh, a, a form of racism and bigotry that is dangerous to everybody. And I, I you know, I appreciate pointing out the, uh, you know, anniversary of the, the, the Tree of Life uh, massacre. Here's an example of somebody who targeted Jews uh, in, in his reasoning. 
because Jew, the, the, he thought that the Jews were supporting an organization uh, that was helping to bring refugees, brown and Muslim refugees, into this country, uh, which would uh, challenge the you know white Christian character of the state. Um, so there's 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 no reasons why people who oppose uh, bigotry everywhere uh, can't uh, understand why anti-Semitism uh, is a problem. And at the same time, we need to speak very clearly uh, against uh, the use of these smears. Uh, to silence uh, Palestinian voices uh, in these conversations. Thank you so much. I, for those who have found this interesting, I um, encourage you to keep an eye out for future Jewish current events. Also, for those who subscribe to my newsletter, we're going to be having a conversation next Friday with Susie Linfield, who has a new essay in The Atlantic, which also deals with a lot of these issues. Someone who takes a quite different position than mine, but that's part of the, the point of these conversations is to, is to have conversations with people who take different perspectives. Um, uh, Jill and Yusuf, I'm, I know you're both very, very, very busy people. I'm really grateful to both of you for taking the hour to talk to us. And thank you all of you who've been part of this. Uh, really appreciate it. Hope you have a wonderful weekend.